Resume recording, actually. Turn my volume up a little bit so I can hear as well. I think the chat should be on. And there we go. This is my first uh, webinar for you guys for Cheat Code. I've been doing this for like 25 years uh, as far as teaching and trading and investing and trading myself, actually. So kind of a, been doing it for quite a while here. So welcome, everybody. And uh, if you got any questions as I go along, like I said, just keep it to yourself. I don't care. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you got any questions, type them in the chat or you know, raise your hand or something. I can uh, unmute you. I think the mics are open anyway. I didn't mute anybody. So however they have these normally set, but I want to welcome everybody here. And looks like we've got more people jumping in. So I'll just get started and we'll go from there. So I'm pretty casual. Like I said, if you got any questions, just hit me up. Um, but basically, I come from the institutional side originally as a trader and um Oops, hang on a second. What's this here? In your room chat. Yeah, there we go. I got it in the wrong setup. Um, so I come from the institutional side. I'll give you a little bit of background about myself in a minute, but uh, we're going to talk about how the pros trade because I was on that side for quite some time. And I still work with a lot of those institutional traders. I actually am um, I have a contractor with a couple of different brokerages still, and I help write some of the educational material for the brokerages uh, that are given to some of the, uh, well, basically to the, the facing the public. For instance, uh, Trade Station is one of those where I write a lot of the videos. I ghost write their content that they post out on the web, web and the YouTube videos. So anyway, getting into what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, this is a free webinar. I actually have another webinar I'm planning on for next week, which I'll talk a little bit about, which is going to go in much more depth. So today we're just going to do about an hour and kind of talk a little bit about the institutional order flow, kind of how it works and what we can do to identify it, because basically the orders from the institutions really drive price. And it doesn't matter if you're trading stock, futures, Forex, crypto even. I mean, you see the whales coming in and pushing prices in certain directions. And if you understand order flow and reading price, then you're way ahead of most other people when they're trying to look at the markets. A lot of people are simply guessing. And I don't do typical supply and demand. Uh, I learned, you know, I'm just sorry, not supply, uh, support and resistance. You know, it's, it's supply and demand is what I trade because there are some basic patterns that are really easy to find once you know what to look for. And as I said, they're pretty much everywhere in every security. I've, I've lived in, uh, where was I? India for two years. I lived in England for about a year. I lived in Singapore for a year. I lived in Dubai for a year. And I was teaching in all those markets. Sorry, my dog keeps jumping on me and licking me. Get out of here. Anyway, um, so when I was teaching in those markets, it was kind of interesting because uh, this is Lucy, by the way. <laughs> you say hi, Lucy. All right. Anyway, uh, well, I was teaching on those markets and the techniques that we use here in the U.S. work the same way no matter where you go in the world. I mean, price is price. It doesn't matter if you're trading dogecoin or if you're trading tesla it all works the same way and it doesn't matter if you're trading the u.s or somewhere else in the market so uh basically i'll like i said i'll talk about how these markets work and how to actually identify supply and demand but next week i'm going to be getting in a lot more depth into actually how to use it how to identify the patterns properly today's just kind of a an overview of how it really works and see if you're interested in learning more because it is not support and resistance i mean that's a key thing Support and resistance can work for a lot of people. I'm not going to say anything bad about it, but I've just found that using the, the supply and demand techniques that I've, I've learned over the years, I learned them probably about 18 years ago or so, uh, just works so much better. Oops, let me get there. So my background, you can see I've been on CNBC a bunch of times. I was actually, uh, I'm a charter market technician, which basically is a master's degree in technical analysis. I think there's about 5,000 in the world right now. So did a lot of studying in the markets and learning about how they work. And obviously, uh, I was got into the markets as a retail broker. If you guys have ever seen the movie Boiler Room or Wolf of Wall Street, it's kind of what I did. Um, it was in the 90s, so we didn't have the Quaaludes, but we had <laughs> uh, a lot of other stuff. But, um, you know, I was a, a penny pusher and I hated it. So I got into back office operations instead. And that's kind of where I got a lot of my experience in trading and how markets work. And that's from looking at the institutional order flow that I was managing. So then I was moving from the brokerage into a private hedge fund in San Diego. And I traded for the hedge fund for a while. And again, you know, trading for a fund with large sums of money is completely different than trading your own money. And you have to do different techniques. So I've been doing that for quite a while. I've been teaching and trading since 1999, really. And uh, 
So that's my background. You can follow me on Twitter if you want. Don't have to. Obviously, I'm here on Cheat Code as well, so you can follow me there in the new in the new app. I'm on Discord, but I guess they're shutting that down anyway. So kind of jump into it, you know, uh, see exactly what's going on here with these markets. And like I said, if you got any questions, the chat is open. Um, but if you want to raise your hand, I guess, I don't know if the mics are muted. I haven't, I haven't really messed with those. But basically, what would happen when I worked, uh, they called it agency desk operations. That's what my job was for the broker. I was basically a trader for a broker. That's all it was. So, you know, a broker would call somebody up. And, um, oh, okay, it's not, good. So a broker would call up a customer and they would get an order to buy or sell a security. And this is back in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. So what would happen would be that they'd write it down the order on a piece of paper called a chit. And basically it was blue for a buy order and pink for a sell order. And these aren't the exact chits that I had, but they're pretty similar. So they would write up these orders and then they would give me the orders and that's where I was at the, the trading desk. And we just had the, uh, if you remember the old CRT monitors, those big monitors that only had green. Did they have stop losses? No, <laughs> no, they did not. Uh, and I didn't actually see stop losses till I was working as a, a trader at the brokerage, or not the brokerage, for the, the hedge fund. But hell no, they didn't have any kind of uh, stop losses typically when the broker was telling to buy or sell. I mean, there's retail brokers, right? They're just telling you to buy whatever they want you to buy or sell. So anyway, I always joke, I say every day I come into my office and there's a huge pile of chit on my desk because I had to deal with all those orders coming in. So basically, from my perspective, my job was to take those orders and there's the old monitors, right? It was literally a monochrome green monitor. I still remember it. And my job was to get that order filled at the best price available. And they call that the NBBO. It's still the same today. It hasn't changed a whole lot, but obviously the chits don't exist anymore. Those are kind of relics. Uh, what happens though, is I was routing both retail and uh, institutional orders because we had institutional customers as well. So it was kind of a mix between the institutions and the retail. And basically once I got the fill notified, I was dealing with um, what they call market makers. So if you've ever done any kind of stock trading, you probably dealt with a market maker. So there's a couple different ways of routing your orders. You can route your order through an ECN or electronic communication network. And they're kind of like mini exchanges, if you will. And orders can get filled there or they can get passed through to the floor of the exchange or now it's all electronic. But those market makers, uh, if you're not familiar with it in stocks, there's I think over 500 market makers still. I'd have to check it out to be honest with you. Actually, kind of curious to see. If I go right here to uh, NASDAQTrader.com. For instance, here you can see it, it shows you, you can look up a symbol, uh, a, a stock symbol name, or sorry, I clicked on it. It said MPID. So if I wanted to, let's say we go to Apple stock. Okay, so here's the stock Apple. And I'm not sure if it's going to let me see the market participants. It kind of changes this around from what they used to have. Nope. Oh, yeah, there we go. Daily market participant position report. And I can look at Apple again and see if it gives me that report or not. Yep, there we go. So these are all the market makers or brokerages, basically is what they are. But these are all the market makers that create liquidity in Apple. Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks. Appreciate it, Gina. All right. I was just looking over some of the chat there. Cool. Oh, okay, cool. So you guys are modifying, uh, modding over there. Cool. And uh, hang on a second. My mouse is acting weird. What the heck? Okay. So anyway, oh, that's why, because I'm zoomed in still. There we go. Now it's better. So anyway, getting back to this, like I said, there's I was dealing with these market makers and getting orders filled. So I was shopping them out, usually with Southwest Securities. I don't know if they're even around anymore. PERT was another one I was dealing with quite a bit. But that's what I was doing with the orders and trying to get those orders filled uh, from, from the market makers back to the customers. So the way it works, it's the same way if you were trading in the agency desk operation like I was, or the other way of uh, getting orders filled was to deal with trading floors. And I've got a lot of friends who are on the trading floor. So basically, you know, I talked about the desk and getting a, a bunch of chits piled up on my desk. So when you're looking at orders, it still works the same way, even though everything's electronic. 
And the way it works is basically if you want to buy something, you think about it. The only way you could buy something is if somebody's willing to sell to you, right? It doesn't matter, again, if it's a stock or if it's Forex or if it's even uh, Bitcoin. It doesn't matter. You cannot buy anything unless somebody's willing to sell. So right now, you know, I would come into my office back in the 90s and I would stack up the orders based on price, okay? And, you know, the same thing happened on the trading floor. A good friend of mine used to work in the pits in Chicago and the futures pits. And we compared notes and talked about this and worked the same way. You stack up the orders based on price. And sometimes, you know, on the floor, you give preferential treatment to certain people for the orders to be filled. Uh, but for me, it wasn't like that. It was just pretty much uh, electronic. So what happens, let's say you want to buy this particular stock at 30 bucks. Well, you see right now, these are the sell orders in pink and the buy orders are in blue. There are no, there's no one who's willing to sell right now at 30 bucks. The lowest price sellers, four of them right there at $31. So if you wanted to buy right now at 30 bucks, what we would do is just simply create an order, write it on the chit or set it up electronically now. And basically, you know, if you trade, that's all you're doing is sending an email to the exchange or, or a text message now, really saying, look, I want to buy at this price. And your order sits there until somebody is willing to sell to you. Now, if nobody's willing to sell to you, or if you want to get your order done quickly, you want to get filled as fast as possible the easiest thing to do is to suck it up and pay a little bit more, right? So what you would do is you would go to the sellers. Right now, the lowest price seller, and this happens the same way today, if you look at the NBBO or you know, look at quotes on the markets anywhere, you just buy from the ask, what somebody's asking. So if you were to buy at 31, you would do two things. One, you're satisfying a bit of demand in the markets, but also you are removing a little bit of supply, right? That's what these sell orders represent. Sell orders represent supply. Buy orders represent demand. It's pretty much what it is. So, you know, think about it. Now there are only three orders left at that 31 level. So if anybody else wants to buy at 31, they better hurry up because there's only three people left to sell. And if all those 31s are gone, now if there's still a lot of buying pressure, even at 31 bucks, nobody's getting filled. So the only way anybody is actually going to be able to buy is if they do what? Obviously, they have to raise their price, right? They have to be willing to buy at the higher price at 32. So if the buyers are still in great demand and wanting this, they will push up to 32. And if all the 32s are taken out, like we just saw there, prices move up. Again, the buyers become more and more aggressive. But you're going to notice two things happening as prices are going up. Number one you notice if I go back here, the number of sellers seems to rise, doesn't it? And that's pretty much with any security. The higher you go in price, typically people are more inclined to want to sell at higher prices, not lower. They want to make money, of course. And the second thing that typically happens is the number of bu the buyers typically decreases for two reasons. One, buyers have either already bought at a lower price or prices are too expensive and they say, you know what? I'm just going to wait until it comes back down. It's not going to buy here. It's, no, it's ridiculous. So that's basically what's happening. And eventually we'll reach a point where if there's no one who wants to buy, okay, think about it. We, we just got all those people. Everybody bought 30, 31. They took out all those orders. 32 took out the orders. 33 took out the orders. Well, now prices are at 34 and nobody wants to buy, right? And a great question just came up. Is this the same for options? In a way, yes, because options are typically going to be traded based on the underlying security, right? So it, it's, it's going to drive the, the value and price of the options based on what the underlying security itself is doing. And by the way, I do trade options. I actually day trade options. I might have to do a session on that sometime. I day trade zero DTE options every day. So I, I do... Um, Zero DTE, if you're not familiar, zero days till expiration. I sell options on the same day they expire and just collect a little bit of premium. And my win rate has been 85% on average for the last three years. So I've been doing pretty well with that. So that'll be a future webinar. We'll get to that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I did one a while back for TradeStation. So I'll definitely do one here. But uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about my strategies. But it actually comes down to what I'm talking about here, supply and demand, because I sell beyond those levels. Okay, so a oh, great question. If I'm looking at this graphic, is it safe to say I'm an expert at reading level two tape? I used to be. I actually do not look at level two anymore. I don't even look at time and sales anymore. 
Uh, when I first got started in trading, you guys got me on sidetrack here, but that's cool. Um, when I first got started in trading, I used to be a scalper. And this was back when markets were trading in uh, teenies, they called it, 16th of a dollar, right? So what would happen is the bid and offer were separated probably by about a quarter, sometimes an eighth. And you would just scalp and try to get in front of the buyers. You would jump in front of the bid, then jump in front of the ask and try to scalp a teeny. And if you did that on, um, basically you would do it on uh, like a thousand shares at a time. You try to buy and immediately try to sell. And you would basically make $62.50. And you think about that and you're like, wow, that seems pretty cool, right? You're only in the trade for a few seconds. You make $62.50? Uh, no, nah, no. Nah. And here's why. We had to do about 400 trades a day to make any money because the commissions at the time were like 30 bucks to get in and 30 bucks to get out. So on $62.50, you made $2.50. So that's why I had to do 400 trades a day. I literally would do 400 trades a day just reading level two. And now I don't do that. Anyway, so getting back to where I'm at here, like I said, I've got a lot of experience. I've done a lot of different types of trading in the past. Now I, I slowed it down a little bit and I'm looking, the, the fastest thing I do is that zero DTE, but I'd still day trades uh, futures for some time. Uh, yes, I was with OTA originally back in 1990, 1999. Yeah, I was with them for about 20 years. Anyway, and that's a good thing to bring up. Actually, um, what I'm teaching right now is uh, basically something that another company, again, I'm not going to say anything good or bad about anybody, but another company charges about four or $5,000 to learn this kind of stuff. And I'm going to be working with you guys, showing this today for free. And then next week, if you want to learn all the details, it's going to be, I think it's only $130 for the, uh, the workshop I'm doing next week. It'll be about two hours, same time, 7 to 9 p.m. But anyway, getting back into this. Here we are, 34 bucks. The buyers drove price all the way up to this wall of sellers. And now there's no more buyers. And you think about it, it's real estate works the same way. If there's nobody willing to buy and there's a whole bunch of houses for sale right now, what do you think people are going to do to sell their house? It's going to be a race to the bottom, right? They're going to start dropping their price to attract buyers. And the same thing happens here in the markets. Prices keep going up until we run out of buyers. There's no more buying pressure. The sellers get nervous and they start dropping their prices down in order to try to attract those buyers. Now, unfortunately, we can't see this order flow, right? But we can see certain patterns that it makes it in the markets. So basically, if we want to look at order flow in action, yeah, I'm waiting for the big drop in the markets too, I believe, yeah, right? So take a look at this market. Okay, it doesn't matter what security it is. It could be anything, really. Again, it works the same way no matter which market you go to. Right now, we're not seeing much of, as far as a trend. We're just kind of going sideways. We got mixed red and green colors, right? And maybe I'll do another session. I got a lot of ideas of sessions I could do. Um, reading price is another key thing that I talk a lot about, kind of going on a sidetrack here just for a moment. Um, just bring up a blank Word document here. If you want to be able to read price properly, again, it doesn't matter what security, it doesn't matter what trading, what time frame, it all works the same way. There's really four key things you need to learn for reading price. Okay. And number one is color. Basically, the dominant color is the trend. But if you happen to have kind of mixed colors in the, in the candles, that equals weak trend. And you're going to see that tonight as I go through a lot of this, okay? Secondly, shape. Okay, oops. When I say shape, the candles, they have an open and close. They have a high and a low. So when we're taking a look at those candlesticks, you basically can look at the shape of the candles and get a lot of information about them. Basically, what I want to look at is the closing price versus the high and the low. Okay, so uh, in a way, what it comes down to, oops, there we go, that's what I want. Uh, what it comes down to is if any price action from the high to the close, that's selling pressure. Okay, basically, you'll see that because you'll have what's called a topping tail. And if you get a topping tail, that's selling pressure. 
you know, the closing price is the most important price out of any time frame. And what happens is if you close away from the high, it's because the buyers gave up and the sellers won. They pushed it down. So any price action you have from the low to the close, that's buying pressure. So therefore, if you have a bottom tail or wick or shadow, whatever you want to call that, that's buying pressure. And that can actually help you identify not just the trend, but what's coming next. You know, if I go out to a chart and, you know, let's do just as a proof here. You know, look at Bitcoin. And you can see that, you know, I got a lot of little lines drawn here. This is a daily chart of Bitcoin. So looking at, well, even right here, as we're moving up, you got green candles and there's almost no topping tail. That means it's very strong, very bullish. Here we have a topping tail. That means from that high down to that close, we had selling pressure. And that's warning us, you know, we had no almost no selling pressure. Now we have selling pressure. Next thing you know, prices start stalling out, don't they? We're getting a lot of topping tails there and we're not making any new highs. Now it won't always be perfect. It won't always happen like that, but often you get warning signs from the candles. And when prices drop, you know it's starting to go or start stopping when you see bottom tails, as you can see right there. There's a nice big bottom tail as price hit my demand zone, actually closed in the next one, but hit this area and bounced off. And you can see we started putting in bottoms there because we had those bottom tails on the candles. So literally you can play what comes next. If I go into something like Tesla, I'll do a 15 minute chart. Okay, this is from yesterday. Okay, so we've got downward pressure right now, but you can see we had buying pressure here and we're getting buying pressure yet again on that last candle. So we may still go down, but if we do, it's not gonna be very fast. And you can see that we just barely made a new low there. Okay, oh, I'll go back to the Word document. You can take screenshots, yeah, absolutely. Again, getting more buying pressure. And there we started going up. But once we tried going up, we actually have kind of a big wick on that candle telling us there's not a lot of buying pressure. Even though we try to come off the load, we still have selling pressure. We may end up going back sideways. And there we go. You can almost guess what's going to come next by seeing that pressure. And here we are moving down. We've got indecision where the buying and selling pressure are almost equal. That's a pause. And it could be a sign that prices are getting ready to turn. And there it goes. So... That's another one. Let me increase the font here so you guys can see this at least. And let's see, we got color, shape. Oh yeah, size matters. <laughs> size of the candles also tells us something. And that can be very important. Basically, if you get large ranged candles, that equals indecision. I'm sorry, not indecision. That's an imbalance. Basically, you've got huge imbalance between buying and selling pressure. And it could be professionals, it could be novices. It's based on where it's located, where it happens. Or if you happen to get small candles, okay? That's trend weakness. And it could lead to a turn in price. And then the last thing, well, what happened there? <laughs> Did I do that or somebody else do the drawing there? That's kind of weird. Am I sharing? Yeah, I think someone someone else did, but we'll clear the screen in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I yeah, I forgot to turn off permissions on everybody's. Anyway, so getting back to the last part here is location, and location is supply and demand. There you go. So those are basically the four key things you really need to learn in order to be able to read price properly. Yeah, I got to disable the annotate. I don't even know where it all is. Usually I have it all set up on my own personal one, but that's okay. Yes. It's a oh, there it is. Disable annotation for others. I got Perfect. it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I got it. <laughs> I found it. All right. So getting back to order flow. And anyway, if you went to a screenshot, there's the picture. This is being recorded too. So we'll be able to review this. And like I said, next week I'm going to go into much more detail as well of how to find all this stuff too. But continuing on with the talk here, getting back into order flow, the way we see it in our chart is kind of amazing. And you can actually identify where the institutions are buying and selling. 
So right here, again, we're just kind of going sideways. We got mixed red and green candles. You know, we did get a little bit of bottom tails here indicating buying pressure. And the next thing you know, boom, we just exploded off the lows. Okay, and before this, now we don't know the order flow was there. Okay, the only way you get to know that stuff is if you're actually working in the offices for the major brokerages, being a market maker or agency desk operator, like I said, what, what I used to do. But right here, you see this area with large green candles. And there's two things that really cause that. Number one, there's almost no sellers in that area. And think about it, there can't be. Because if there were a lot of sellers in that area, prices would have stayed there. They would have sold right at the level that the buyers were at. And we would have gone sideways. But there's an imbalance. And because there's nobody willing to sell, if you want to buy something, you have to raise your price to attract those sellers, right? It just makes sense. It's common sense when you think about it. Now, the other thing that usually happens when you get a big move like this out of nowhere, it's typically from the big institutions, okay? Now, it's not 100%. It's not always. In technical analysis, everything always happens except when it doesn't, okay? And that's why we always have stop losses to protect ourselves in case we're wrong. But typically, that big move like that, that big move to go up like that, that's the or origin of an imbalance, now think about this. There's no sellers in this area or it's not likely to be that many. Who Think about how you would have felt if you had sold at that price level and then prices went all the way up here. How are you feeling? That's not a good feeling, is it? Knowing that you sold here when you could have sold way up here. Do you think any rational person would want to sell if prices get back down there again, knowing they could have sold at a much higher price? Probably not. So there's probably not going to be sellers there in the future. We have the origin of an imbalance where there was a big buying pressure. Could have been one person, could have been a bunch of people. But yeah, we want to buy low and sell high. So there's not likely to be sellers there before. Okay. Yeah, there could have been a lot of people who sold and prices jumped up higher, but they're probably not going to want to sell if prices get down there again because they know they could probably sell at a much higher price. Secondly, what do you think? Do you think if a big institution wanted to buy a lot of shares, they got everything they wanted all at once? Not really. See, I'll talk a little bit about what's called uh, working the order. Oh, did you have a question, JD? I saw the hand go up there. The or just high five. <laughs> uh, he just he was just answering the question with uh, how many people have sold, uh, mm. and then the price jumped up even higher. Yeah. Hey, we've all been there. I'm sure if you've ever traded, it's happened, <laughs> right. Right? right? Yeah, I'm guilty. I mean, I lost 32 grand in 15 minutes one time. And um, I remember what I ate because I saw it coming back up that day for lunch. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, you know, if, if the prices have gone up from that area, we're not likely to see the sellers there again. So that could be a really good area to buy in the future. And if it's an institution that bought there, the highest probability is they're going to have leftover orders. See, what happens with institutions is when they try to buy and sell, they try to buy and sell in, a, in an area. You as an institutional trader, and I had to do this, like I said, I did it for a hedge fund. I've actually coached um, money managers on how to do order flow and actually work their orders. That's the term, it's called working the order. You got to break up your order into small pieces. Because you know, if Warren Buffett went out to the market and said, listen, I'm going to buy a, you know 5 million shares of, of uh, Apple. Everybody and their grandmother is going to start buying Apple, right? And he's never going to be able to buy all of his shares at a cheap price. So you have to try to fly under the radar. I mean, you got these um, algo traders now that are trying to flag block trades of over 10,000 shares. So if you're smart, you do what's called an iceberg order. You break your order into small pieces and funnel it in a little at a time. If prices leave your area that you're willing to buy, you wait until it comes back. If it never comes back, that's it. So be it. But what you do is you got to buy in a certain range you know is a good value for your purchase. Otherwise, you're going to get fired from the hedge fund so or wherever you're trading. So they can't get everything they wanted filled all at once. That means there's a high probability of two things. One, because there were no sellers here before, or anybody who did sell got burnt, they're not going to want to sell here in the future. Number two, that was probably caused by a big institution who has a lot of leftover orders to buy if prices return to that area. Ah, that means we should buy if prices come back here. Well, you know, if we're not right all the time, we better put in a stop loss just in case. Maybe it was the last bit of orders they wanted to put in. You know, 
put in a stop loss, no big deal. So prices have rallied up and you can see, we just ran into an area. There's actually a lot of selling pressure up there. So the buyers have exhausted themselves and it comes right back down. Is that an order block? Not necessarily, but yeah, this is how you get some double and triple tops and bottoms. Absolutely. I mean, this is the this is really what drives price in any security. Doesn't matter what you're trading. This is how it works. So you can see that prices collapsed from that high. Why? Because we had lots of sellers. But where did it come down to? It comes down to the origin of imbalance more often than not. So now it comes back down to that area where we saw there were a lot of buying pressure, but no sellers. So now we buy the remainder of the, the uh, institutional buy orders click in and they push prices right back up. So we buy at the low and we get to sell at the high because this happened to be a supply zone where prices stopped rallying and gave us a nice drop. So if you can identify those patterns, and there's actually only four, okay, it's relatively simple. It's not easy, by the way, but it's simple, okay? Simple is not easy. <laughs> Let's make that for sure. But uh, this is, by the way, if you're wondering what this was and how this worked out, this was the S&P 500 futures today. That's exactly what happened earlier today. This happened to be a one-hour chart on the S&P. There was a buying opportunity here at the low, came right up to the area supply. So that's the way I look at the markets. I go back and look, and again, it doesn't matter what security we're trading. I got Tesla up here. Uh, as a matter of fact, looking at my screen right now, we see there's an area right here where prices, I guess they must've gapped up, but you can see we had an origin of imbalance, lots of buying pressure and no sellers in that area, okay? So when prices come back to that area, well, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> we'll have to see what happens. I should probably pick a different security and go back a little bit further, or even the same security, like I said, just go back to random time. Oops, let me clean this up. I guess I was doing a lot of notes on this one. Again, just going back to random time and random security, it works the same way for origins of imbalance for selling. You get areas of supply, origin of the imbalance down, and there's certain patterns that you can look for. It gets easier with practice, obviously. Not every turning point is going to be an origin of imbalance or a demand or supply zone. This happened to be a little one right here that we tested right away. Let's see. Broke through on the second test. And let's see, do we have any supply? Not nearby, really. The supply zone I had up here is the, first, the closest one I saw. Let's try to see if there's anything else. There's another demand zone that was formed. That's not great here. And actually, uh, it's already showing what happened, but there was the other origin of imbalance that actually broke out above the prior high. And you can see that that would have been a good buying opportunity. But you'll learn as I go through this, by the way, this is not the same thing as support because support, a lot of people say, oh, it's just a turning point in the markets. Well, the turning point was actually here where the bounce happened, but demand was up here. And another thing that's wrong with supply uh, support resistance is they say usually the more times an area is test, the stronger it becomes. It's so actually, I'm going to show you the opposite. So we're going to break through that eventually if it comes back to it. Up oh, here's a good demand zone. You know, you want to look for the most obvious imbalances. Prices exploded from that area. Why? No sellers and probably a large buyer in that area. And we came back down, it bounced, it did react, but based on trend, which is another factor I haven't gotten to yet, you see we ended up breaking through that area. But it did react. We reacted right there by bouncing. We couldn't go straight through the area because it was an area of imbalance, a demand zone. Uh, do I mark my supply and demand zones on the time limit I trade? Great question. I'll have to get to this another time, but I actually trade on three time frames, And the way I trade and this is something that's kind of important as well, is number one, my lower time frame that I choose, I call it my zone time frame. And on the zone time frame, it's where I find supply and demand. And I use that for entries and targets. Okay. Now, a demand zone could be used for two different things, okay? And the reason why, if you think about it, you can either be entering a long 
or you could be exiting a short, right? So how do you know which one you're supposed to be doing? Well, that would be the trend. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so basically right now, the trend time frame that tells me, or I should just say the trend, direction of trade. Which way should I be trading, long or short? It's based on the trend. The zones give me the entries and exits. The trend tells me which direction to trade. And then I have what's called my perspective time frame. And the supply and demand zones here tell me where trends will end. Because trends don't go on forever. They'll just let me know where the trend is likely to end. Because that's a good thing to know, isn't it? Whoops, I had the bold on. There we go. So I use three different time frames, and there's actually a relationship between the three different time frames. I don't pick them at random. Okay. Uh, the lower time frame, I do, you can pick whatever one you want. It's based on what your comfort level is. And I'll do a section, a session on that sometime, multiple time frame analysis, because it goes all the way back to the late 1800s. Charles Dow and um, I can't remember the other person's name right now, but uh, they created this multiple time frame analysis to identify the waves of the market they actually call them waves and then it became elliott wave and a bunch of other people came on this um anyway my zone time frame i decide that first zone time frame and then my trend time frame is my zone time frame multiplied by quattro senko or seis or char ponch che right that would be four five six in hindi <laughs> sanchi go that's japanese if you want Okay, so I can keep going a bunch of different languages, but I'm not going to. So I multiply four, five, or six, and that's how I get my bigger time frame. So for instance, as an example, if I'm using a 15 minute zone time frame, I might use a uh, 60 minute trend. And then I'll use a 240 minute perspective time frame. Because what happens is with the time frame analysis, Again, to get the next step up, my perspective time frame is the trend time frame, again, multiplied by either four, five, or six. Now, it doesn't have to be the same multiple. It could be a different one, okay? But the reason why is you don't want to jump from an intraday chart to like a daily or weekly chart. You're going to miss the trends that are actually affecting what you're trading on. So you got to make sure you use a related time frame. And the best number is usually five. Um, there's a, a book by Dr. Alexander Elder. And he talked about this many, many years ago. In uh, it's called Trading for a Living. So it's uh, multiple time frame analysis. He came up with it, I think, in 1985. Strat TFC, I'm not sure what that is. I haven't seen that one. Anyway, but yeah, you know, the answer is I look at the zone time frame to find my zones. And I also make sure I'm trading in the right direction. So I'm kind of curious to see, did we ever use that supply zone way up there on Tesla? And going all the way up here, you can see we actually overshot it a little bit, but we did react to it. And by the way, that time frame, that zone was from November of last year, and it was hit in February of this year. So the zones can last for quite some time until they're used. Let's see if the upper one ever was hit. As we go forward, I don't know if we gapped up to that yet. I don't think so. Oops. Yeah, it's 220 right there. And look at that. So that was found in February of 2022. Or no, I'm sorry, November 2022. And there it was in 2023, June, actually working as a supply zone. You know, I have to go back in time to find zones sometimes. You know, I'll, I'll show you an example. I mentioned my zero DTE options. These, this is my workspace for my zero DTE options. And some of the zones, I usually don't have to go back too far, but August 28th for demand, August 25th, 818, 612. I've got zones marked off from quite some time ago. I'm going to sell zero DTE options on if need be. Today, I just sold them on these zones and it profited. Basically, I sell where options are, or where prices are not going to go. So anyway, getting back to this, with supply and demand, I mentioned working the order. You know, looking at some stocks here, I just brought up the level, the market depth. And you can see as an institutional trader, if I want to buy even a thousand shares of something, there's no way I could buy it all at once, right? 
Because if I wanted to buy from this ask, there's only 52 shares at the inside bid. Then another six, another six right there, or nine, you know, if I'm trying to sell. If I do a thousand, it's going to swipe. They actually had a button called the swipe in uh, what's called Ready Plus many, many years ago. I'm not going to get into that. That's old time trading. But uh, it basically, if you could, you would swipe, you would actually take out a whole bunch of price levels and move price too fast. So what I said you had to do is break the order into smaller pieces and work the order so that way nobody would actually see exactly what you're doing. You can buy and accumulate your big position by doing it in small pieces. And the way you have to do it, as I was saying, is in time. And it could take days, sometimes even weeks, but this also works in smaller time frames as well. So for instance, if I was looking at Euro US dollar. We'll go to a Forex pair now and I'll go to a four hour time frame. If I'm looking at this, it works the same way as it does on any other security. Say I wanted to buy the euro around 108. Okay, well, I may not buy right at 108 as an institution. I may buy in the area of 108, right? And they'll identify an area where they're willing to buy. And you can see the imbalance here. Prices exploded upwards because there wasn't a whole lot of sellers in this 108, 109 area. So if prices return to that area, there's a high probability, and you can see it actually bounced just before it. I probably could have marked the zone a little bit better. Let's see, that's drop base rally right there. And you can see it just barely flagged that area and bounced. And unfortunately, there's an imbalance here, so it pushed it right back down. And it bounced a couple times. There's a lot of buying pressure there, isn't there? So, but one of the things you'll notice, subtle, but notice what happened every time we hit that area, we went a little deeper. You know why? Less orders. But that area was the origin of imbalance. And you can see it's a great buying area, wasn't it? So like I said, I showed you on a crypto. I showed you on Bitcoin already. I showed you on uh, Forex. I showed you on stocks, futures, obviously. Uh, oops, 2023. Here's crude oil, for instance. Again, if I go into, heck, I'll go down to a five-minute time frame. And just a random date going back in time here works the same way. I start off at current price and work my way back looking for specific patterns that show me the origin of imbalance. And when we return to the origins of imbalance, those are opportunities to buy and or sell in the future. I don't think I have any great supply zones. That one's already used. Maybe back here. Let's see. Yeah, it's not great. There's things we're going to talk about next week in my, my other workshop where I'm going to talk about the odds enhancers and how to find the right zones, the ones that are going to work the best. So anyway, going to where I was just now, I forgot where it was. There it is. Unfortunately, this demand didn't work. And you can see we reacted a little bit to it. It bounced, but perhaps the trend was down. It broke through. That's obviously why we have our stop losses. And by the way, look what happened when we came up to that supply zone. It worked. Look at that held prices down for a while before it eventually broke. So this stuff works. I didn't, mean, I didn't make it up. I found out about it. I mentioned there's four basic patterns. Next week, I'm going to show you exactly how to find those four basic patterns. Thank you. There's a link for it as well. Uh, we have demand zones. For demand zones, we have two basic patterns. We have what's called drop, base, and rally. Where prices are moving down, we go into that equilibrium phase where the buyers and sellers are somewhat equal. It shouldn't last a long time. And the reason why is if it lasts a long time, that means the institution got all the orders filled. So there's not going to be you know a big leftover orders when we come back there again. And then the rally is extremely important because we want to see that origin of imbalance. So when we come back to that area, there's likely to be a lot of buyers, not a lot of sellers, and prices should bounce again. The alternative one is called a rally-based rally. And when you think about it, the rally-based rally is usually a little more common because in a trend, you should be making higher lows and higher highs for an uptrend, right? So when you return back down, right, we make a higher low. And we usually make the higher lows at rally-based rallies. Hey, Brandon, well, for supply zones, is that a question? Sorry, I just want to say something real quick. Just so yeah. everybody who's listening to this, right, if you guys are looking at this, when you see this drop-based rally, rally-based rally, does this not look very similar, identical to double bottoms, triple bottoms, bull flags, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like these are very similar, 
you know, it's pretty much explaining why these things happen. And what I really appreciate about, you know, this institutional trading and everything Brandon's talking about right now is that it puts the context behind the things that we see. So when people say things like, oh, technical analysis, oh, technical analysis doesn't work. You're just looking at shapes and patterns, but you really have no idea. It's like this, what Brandon is talking about is the context behind why those patterns are forming, why they're working and things of that nature. So just keep that in mind when you guys are paying attention to these things. There's a lot, there's a lot of overlap with this, but what you're looking at is really context and why these things are happening, which is very important to uh, to put your strategy together. So Brandon, yeah. you, you keep doing <laughs> that way. You're on fire, man. I love it. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, to answer the question real quick, Kevin, yes, I'm only just using a modified supply and demand. I'm sorry, modified uh, Fibonacci tool. So I have it saved right here and I have a couple different templates. So one I use is zones. All I've done here for the trading view is I got zero and one and that's it. And I just have the, the price on the, uh, let's see. Yeah, values on the right. So I'm using that rather than having to go and draw two horizontal lines, just easier. So I've, yeah, I just modify the Fibonacci tool. And then I, I save it as one of my favorites because if you go here on trading view, just put a little star there. It keeps it in your pop-up so you can access it. And then if you're drawing a lot, if you hit control and click on one, it duplicates it and you can bring another one out. So I know a lot of little tricks from software. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, this is kind of the, the why behind everything. Tomorrow, uh, Next week, I'm going to talk about really just how to use it. So today is all the why behind it and what's causing price movement, really. So yeah, the, the other side here, we got the rally base drop for supply or drop base drop, especially in downtrends where you have lower highs and lower lows, right? It just makes common sense when you really think about it. So those are the four patterns. And next week, as I said, if you join me in the workshop, I'm actually going to show you how to identify them properly. And I have really cut and dry rules to make it easier. Now, not every zone is going to fit into those cookie cutters. Oh, yeah. Well, not because it was right, so just. Mike going. There we go. Anyway, so I was saying, you know, I found this slide support and resistance that somebody was talking about before, and I don't use the same techniques. And the reason why, as I said before, you know, think about it. This is showing resistance or support being tested multiple times and working. Sometimes that happens. And I even showed you some examples where it worked. But for the most part, you know, think about the sand. I live in South Florida, so I'm near the beach and I go there a lot. And, you know, when a wave hits the beach, it doesn't give more sand. It takes away sand. It erodes it. Every time prices hit a level, it's removing orders, not making it stronger. So what I need to do is I've got to find the leftover orders that are going to be basically causing prices to bounce up or drop down again. And what I need to find are fresh zones, okay? Oh, yeah, how I get supply and demand zones in order to draw the lines? Oh, I'm going to show you next week. That's what I said. Yeah, I haven't actually talked about how I physically identify the zones. That's next week that I'm going to be doing that in. Tonight, I'm just kind of talking about what they are and showing you why they're caused and just seeing if you're interested in learning more about it. That's all. So... Anyway, I want to find the fresh zones. When you take a, back, a look back here, what happened today? Remember, this was the S&P 500 today. I identified that origin of demand. This is where the origin of the buy orders and the imbalance happened. And that's where the leftover orders are the greatest because they only got some of the orders filled. The first test, there's fewer leftover orders because we just used a bunch of those buy orders to push prices up again. And you notice what happened when it came down, there were fewer buy orders and it was able to break. So the more times an area is tested, the weaker it becomes. I usually only test, or sorry, only trade the very first test of a zone. That's it, period. And the same thing happened on the top, if you notice. We had the origin of supply, most leftover sell orders right there. When we came back up into that area, we tested it again. We you know, took away a lot of the sell orders that were there. And therefore, you notice we moved a little bit deeper as we came in again. And I think, I don't know if I'm still on the same chart. Yeah, I mean, any of these, it shows you the same thing. Here's the first test and prices move down pretty well. Each subsequent test, we go a little deeper or even through, even if the zone still works. Well, there's lower probabilities. I typically only take the first test. And of course, the trend has to be in my favor as well, unless the trend is reversing. That's where I pick top and pop, tops and bottoms. And you can pick tops and bottoms. You just got to know where they're going to be. That's all.
And it's just the supply and demand from higher time frames. So, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm going to be doing this again next week. So hopefully you guys enjoyed what you heard so far, but everything I talked about can be used on any asset class. And yes, even options, because like I said, with options, what I need to do first is identify what's going to happen with my underlying security. So for instance, if I'm selling the zero DT options here on the SPX, actually, do I have the picture from today? I think I do somewhere. Hang on. Uh, there we go. Uh, I got too many things open. No, nope, that's my trade station stuff. <laughs> there we go. Trade screenshots. And I just got to find today. Brandon, I've never seen such an organized drive. I might need to hire you to come in and organize our, our Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've got so many projects going all the time. I got to keep it as organized as possible. Today's mm -hmm. what, the 12th? There we go. So today, the 12th. And I put it beyond the other screen there. So I'll move this over this way. You can see that today at, and every screenshot I do, I also do a timestamp too. But what I did today was you can see I sold options. Let me zoom in so you can actually see the numbers there. It was, it was a 4455 put, 4460 put for 35 cents, 63% probability of profit at 2.14 p.m. Well, you go out and take a look and actually the zone broke but I got lucky at the end of the day. And here's the one, I think it was this right here. Yep. So what happened was I identified this as a five minute zone today. Again, this was at two o'clock, a little bit after two, as a matter of fact, right there. And it actually got a little bit more in premium. I ended up getting about 50 cents out of it. We went and dipped a little bit below, but because of the trend, I sold the 60s, not the 65s, because I wanted to be below the zone and it expired out of the money by $1.91. Yeah, that was Tasty Works. That was Tasty Works on the brokerage. And then the other one that I did today, it doesn't show the actual price I got, but I did sell because I do a screenshot of every trade I do. That way, you know, <laughs> as Quay was saying, I got, you know, all these records of everything and everything's organized here. Uh, the 12th again, Iron Condor. That's the wrong one. Where'd you go? There, nope, that's the other one. There we go. And it actually got more than this because it was this was only at 30 cents. But you can see I was looking at the 4445, 4450, 4490, 4495 iron condor for 30 cents. I up getting about uh 45 cents out of this today. But what happened was I just simply used supply and demand to figure out where prices were not going to go. There's my supply zone that I sold the calls above, and there's my demand zone on a 15 minute and the five minute that I sold the puts below and that's it. And I just do that every day at 2 p.m. And by 4 p.m., I get to keep the premium. And uh, yeah, it works pretty well, but it's all based on supply and demand. So it works on futures, as I mentioned. I actually am a little bit more of an advanced futures trader. I do what is called spread trading in futures. So not only do I do option spreads, but I do futures spreads. Let's see, September. Yeah, this one's more interesting. Unfortunately, it hasn't come into my entry yet, but basically I'm trading the, ki the Kiwi versus the Swissy. It's almost like a cross pair, but I'm using futures to do it. Or I could trade feeder cattle versus feeder cattle or gold versus platinum. That's a good one. That one, unfortunately, I couldn't take the entry because right here, you can see this was my entry spot for my demand. It wasn't really a, a very good demand area anyway, and it was possibly tested multiple times. Plus, we had too much whoops, too much momentum as we came down into it. So like I said, there's a lot of stuff that I talk about uh, in my trading. And the main thing is, uh, it all comes down to supply and demand. I'm going to teach you the rules, how to actually identify supply and demand, how to identify those patterns. And what I have, I call with uh, base versus leg candles. I'll teach that to you next week. Uh, again, it's going to be the 19th at 7 p.m. And uh, yeah, there's the... Uh, I think the link was posted just a little while ago. Why 2 p.m. to sell those? Because there's only two hours left. And here's a little secret for you. The reason why 2 p.m. is usually just after 2 p.m. is when the theta starts coming out of the options. So you'll see a big drop in the value of the options, usually right around 3 p.m. every day. 
Technically, Theta is supposed to come out after the close for that particular day. But the way that the market makers on the floor, the SIBO, it's all electronic now, but I got a friend of mine who used to work on the SIBO floor. The way they start adjusting the time value and the Theta for those options, it starts eating away greatly at about 2.30 to 3 p.m. So if I can sell at about 2 p.m., first of all, I've only got two hours left of risk, right? I don't have to worry about any overnight positions. I sleep well at night, <laughs> no risk. But I also can collect just small amounts of premium, anywhere from 35 cents to a dollar. And if I do 10 contracts, I mean, that's a pretty good day. You're looking at anywhere from 7% return up to 30% return. So it works. Wow. So anyway, um, like I said, there's a lot more stuff I can get to in the future, but this is where I'm going to get started at least, which is the core stuff that I use for everything. Brandon, I love everything you said, man. This was absolutely fire, man. My God. I love the uh, the cross commodity future spreads. Never even seen that done. So that's definitely different. That's really cool. I'm um, definitely excited to see more about, you know, the, the things that you're talking about. Um, everybody on the call, man, listen, it gets deep, man. It gets deep. There's a lot of amazing, amazing traders and trading styles and, and thought process out there, you know, um, and there's just so much to learn. So make sure you guys are tapping into this. As you guys know, Chico.com, we're really pushing a lot more, you know, free classes, free game, but as well as in-depth uh, game as well. So when you're talking about, you know, workshops, some a lot of the workshops that we're doing, I mean, just look at this guy. Look at look at the bow tie in this picture. I mean, is this not some... Is this not yeah, I forgot to wear my ties today. <laughs> I lazy. love the bow tie, man. Look. If you want to get to the point where you're wearing a bow tie like that, man, you got to make sure that you're tapped in, man. So um, look, make sure you all attend the, the next workshop. Seriously, um, make sure you guys are tapped in, Chico.com. You can always reach Brandon also in the chat rooms. He's always lighting up the chat rooms with a lot of great content. So make sure you guys are in there. I know we've had a couple issues and things of that nature with the app. Trust me, nobody's more frustrated with it than I am. I've been really you know, fighting with developers all week long to make sure that uh that everything works fine so we got a lot of those issues worked out so make sure you guys are in there uh and get the get the game man the recording is going to be sent out uh via email as well as we're going to get it posted on the chico.com site and um and available in the app as well so make sure you guys be on the lookout for that and um yeah man stay tuned stay by your phones stay by your Stay up by your phones and your emails and just pay attention to the communications coming out because we got a lot more fire classes coming down the pipeline. And again, make sure you guys tapped into Brandon's class. It's going to have a lot of fire. This guy's got game for years. I don't even want to say game for days. He's got game for years to really uh, take things to the next level. So appreciate you guys, man. Brandon, thank you yes, so much. Yeah, by the way, I'm not on the Discord. I'm really, I mean, I have an access to it, but I don't use it. I'm on the new platform on the new cheat code. So go into the cheat code community. That's where I am. You can get a hold of me there. Awesome, man. All right, y'all. Stay tuned, Art, man. Thank you so much. Brent, you want to do a Q&A or, or anything like that? Or? Um, yeah, I can for a little bit. If anybody's any, any questions, any? Yeah. All right. Anybody have like, you know, one or two quick questions? No? Okay. All right. Good to go, man. Appreciate you, Brandon. I have a question. Sure. Um, the class, I know you were kind of going all over different areas of futures and versus um, options, but um, are you going to have your classes detailed to where we can follow it based upon what we're trading? Um, like maybe um, one on just options and one on just on futures, because some of us don't trade everything. Yeah, no, I actually was brought in as a uh, futures instructor. So that was my primary thing. That's normally what I do is trade futures. Um, but I do I do trade everything. But yeah, I, I actually was also asked to bring in a little bit of Forex stuff. But yeah, I'm going to be focusing primarily on futures in the workshop as well, but or whatever anybody really wants to talk about. And we can actually go step by step. Today was just kind of a showcase type thing. But when I'm teaching, I'm going to be going much slower and more methodical. So you'll be able to follow along and practice right along with me, no matter what software you're on. Uh, but yeah, I typically focus primarily on futures. But like I said, I mean, this works on anything. Um, but yeah, I do. I'm, I, what do you normally trade? Uh, it's crystal, right? Yes. Options. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, with options, you're always looking at the underlying security anyway. So if it's options on stocks, again, we can look at equities. You know, so I was just asking about zones on Tesla uh, near a supply zone. Well, that's a loaded question. 
question because it depends on what time frame you're looking at. <laughs> so if you're looking at Tesla supply, uh, you've got obviously the highs up here. So if you're looking at where you're selling, you know, there's your supply right there, the origin of that imbalance down. Gaps are big imbalances. You know, there was nobody willing to buy. So the only way to sell anything was to gap the price down, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I don't see any demand on the daily chart, honestly, until down here. Like I said, there are patterns that I follow and look for. And that's what I'm going to teach next week, the actual patterns. And if you're trading options, number one is to figure out, um, you know, which way is the underlying security going to go? Is it up, down, or is it sideways? And then number two, I, I, the way I teach options is really three steps. One is what's the underlying security going to do? Two, are options cheap or expensive? So should you buy them or sell them? And then step three is choose the right strategy. So. Okay, so it's something that applies to everyone, not just... It definitely does. Yeah, this stuff that I'm teaching originally right now is going to be applicable to no matter what it is you trade. Yeah, and that's why I was trying to show a little bit of every asset for everyone. Okay. All right. Appreciate you, Brandon, man. Thank you so much, guys. Make sure you guys tap in, uh, and, and uh, we'll see you on the app, man. All right. Have a good night, Brandon. And everybody, man, drop some fire! Drop some fire in the chat for Brandon Miller. Unmute and just show some love, man. Let, let's get it louder here, man. Appreciate you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. That was great. Great class. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Quay. Thank you, Brandon. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, Brandon. Fire! 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 Y'all make sure you hit the app five stars, man. Go to app stores everywhere, Chico.com. See you guys on the app. Let's get it loud up in there. Let's go. Yes, sir. Thanks, guys.